Hey, I'm Bob Runkel, and for as long as I can remember, I've loved pop culture. Despite the challenges I've faced in my life, pop culture has always been there for me. I love talking to people and being a platform for others to share their thoughts and stories. Because if there's one thing I never get tired of, it's seeing driven, talented, and inspiring individuals follow their dreams, no matter what obstacles are in their way. And I know a thing or two about that. Welcome to the DJ Bob Show. I'm DJ Bob. Roll it. The DJ Bob Show. Pop culture, past and present. And now, here's your host, DJ Bob. I'm so excited to welcome our next guest. And by excited, I mean really excited. Today, I'm joined by someone that I grew up watching without even knowing it and reading his book. We're joined by Alan Keck. He is a children's book author, best known for, well, the one that I got familiar with him from, Take Me Out of the Bathtub and Other Silly Dilly Songs. He was a television writer on The Rosie O'Donnell Show and a bunch of other stuff. And we talk about everything. We talk a lot about Rosie. We talk a lot about his books. We talk about the writing process. We just cover a lot. And I'm happy to say, since we recorded this, that the book that he's heavily promoting at the end of this, Get the Hell Out of My House, is now out. We recorded this a couple of weeks back, but I just wanted to tell you that now so you weren't confused when he said he's coming out this week. It's a fun chat, and he's a fun guy, and I hope you have fun listening to it. Enjoy. First of all, can you kind of give us the elevator pitch of who you are and what you've done? Well, sure. Uh, I've been a writer my entire career. I have never had a job that wasn't creative in some way, uh, except perhaps working for my dad's children's shoe store uh, back in Cedarhurst, Long Island. Um, But I've always been a writer and I've been blessed to be able to to write in many different forms from amusement park theme shows to stage shows in Atlantic City to television, children's books, adult books. I've written a lot of advertising, a lot of sales promotion, created contests and games for people like McDonald's and Pepsi, did trading cards, comic books. So you know, I've, I've been, as I say, blessed to be able to do a lot of different creative things. So what is something that you've done that you're proud of that you wish people talked about more? That was just cool. Is there- well, I'll tell you something that's very cool that that my kids, I have four incredibly wonderful kids, and they're probably, after having done 50 books and been nominated for six daytime Emmys, losing each time. But um, all the writing I've done over the years, I think the thing they're most proud of is a commercial I did for I Can't Believe It's Not Butter, in which Megan Mullally sings Turn the Tub Around to get people to read the back of the tub (laughs) and see the ingredients and the nutritional value um, to the tune of Turn the Beat Around, Vicki Sue Robinson's Turn the Beat Around. And it was an advertising campaign, both on the net and on TV. And I think that's the thing that they've shown their kids, they've shown their friends the most and, and somehow been proudest. And that's the, the one, that's one of the things I wanted to kind of dig deeper into, like, how did that come to you? Because I was looking into that before we spoke. Well, I, it's funny. I'm, I'm somebody who, one project turns into another, turns into a different area. I mean, as I track back on, on my career a little bit, you know, that happened because I had worked at the Rosie O'Donnell show. I was one of the people writing her daily song parodies and Broadway parodies, uh, wrote and co-wrote hundreds of songs for that show and met someone there who later left to do um, sponsored 
advertising featuring celebrities and he hired me to do the the butter song uh we also did a campaign for dove dove cream uh, there was a product called dove night in which we put uh um, felicity huffman i couldn't get her name felicity huffman into classic sitcoms literally using um industrial light and magic i believe they used they put her into leave it to beaver they put her into the monsters and there was one other show uh the brady bunch and they replaced other characters and put her in using dove knight in a in a dream sequence again that's a project that wouldn't have come to me unless i had worked with someone at the rosie show so you never know when something's going to lead to something's going to lead to something those are those are fun spots because i love when companies utilize pop culture in such a fun and interesting way yeah we were able to take existing clips of leave it to beaver and put her in you know with with great camera magic put her in and talk to beaver and he's like you know he he literally had a line like hey lady what are you holding and that was an actual clip from the show and she's able to say oh this it's my cell phone and then they cut back to beaver saying where'd you get that and it it's a you know it's a seamless conversation very different than songwriting very different than than other advertising but but even you know talking about the rosie show for a second even that led to my writing song parody books for kids like take me out of the bathtub and i'm now you know 20 years later i'm now 50 books into my into my book career so you never know when something's going to lead to something else so i have to admit like over the last couple months months the rosie o'donnell show has had this resurgence due to its 25th anniversary this year right so can you tell me kind of how your day-to-day was working on that show well sure uh, we were living in um connecticut then as i do now and we were in weston connecticut i would drive to the train about 5 30 in the morning take a one-hour train ride i would have seven newspapers on my lap back when it was possible to have newspapers on your lap and i would read the papers find out what was going on in the world and when i got to nbc where we did the show it was live at 10 a.m but i got there probably a little before 7 a.m i would have already written up a pitch for that morning so we would meet with uh there was mostly two writers uh and and a head writer and rosie and i would meet and I'd either pitch something that was in the news, you know, a new candy bar or a new candy bar, you know, sensation or something like that. If it grabbed her attention, I would go write it or co-write the song or whatever the bit was uh, for the morning. Um, It would be written. We'd show it to Rosie in her dressing room, probably about, I guess, about 830 to nine o'clock if she liked it. Great. If not, we'd rewrite it a little bit. Then it would go to teleprompter and we were live at 10 a.m. For the guest segments like the games and the audience games and anything we would play with a celebrity or do with a celebrity, we had the rest of the day to be able to craft that for uh, the next day or, or a few days hence. You know, if we knew Regis Philbin were coming on, we could do a bit of business with him. Uh, didn't have to be written that morning. It could be written a few days before. Yeah, like one of the things that I vividly remember, one of the segments that I vividly remember is this ongoing trivia feud with this girl named Davina or something about Mary Tyler, Mary Tyler Moore or something like that. Yeah. So when something like that happens, you know, are you involved in that? Like, is that team staged? But was it? No, oh, oh, it was very much not staged. As I remember, Davina McFadden was in the audience and Rosie loved to talk to audience members um, during commercial breaks or whenever she had a chance before or after the show. And Davina was in the crowd. She was an actress, but she was not 
staged. It was in no way, she happened to be an actress as her, as her career. Um, but somehow she said to Rosie, you know, I love how much I'm paraphrasing, but I love how much pop culture, you know, but there's no question. I know more about Mary Tyler more than you do. And Rosie, you know, because she, her comedic instincts and her, her, Hey, that could be a segment instincts are better than anybody's in show business. I said, Oh yeah, I'll take you on. And we huddled, I, I guess it was the next day with Casey St. Ange, who was the other writer with me at that time. Uh, she's now a, a top executive producer and, and podcaster out in Hollywood. Um, she and I did the bulk of the writing and, and Jeanette Barber was the, the head writer. And we met and said, let's do a challenge. Let's do a, a Rosie against Davina. We'll, we'll play fair. It's an absolutely fair challenge to see who knows more. And Rosie called because Rosie could. Rosie called Mary Tyler Moore and said, hey, would you host? And we did the Mary Tyler War. I, j- I just remember that lasting like week because it went on the people's court like, <laughs> like a couple of weeks. Well, what yeah. happened was, yeah, I think we did it. I don't remember, honestly, who won. But whoever won, it was kind of on a technicality. And the other player challenged the veracity of some information or the way it was said or something like that. So I think I have it in the right order. We took the show to California and we actually shot another Mary Tyler war on the Jeopardy set. It was Rosie against Davina and Alex hosted Alex Trebek hosted. And there, too, there was some feud. It wasn't a nasty feud, of course. It was just a a disagreement over some fact or some chronological order or something like that. And we ended up at the people's court. That's right. I just remember it being because I was literally I was like four or five years old, but I was so dialed into like pop culture at the time that it even sucked me in and it got me into those older sitcoms and Broadway and just the, I, so thanks for being part of that show. <laughs> oh, listen, I loved every second of it. It was, it was absolutely a dream come true because you know what? Every day was a, fr- was a blank slate, was a fresh opportunity to do something. I remember we used to tape Friday's show on Thursday afternoon so that Rosie could generally uh, have Friday off. And it gave us a chance to catch up on other work for the following week. And I remember on the Thursday morning show, Rosie said something about the song Dankeschön, the Wayne Newton song Dankeschön. And John McDaniel, who was an extraordinary and is an extraordinary musician and band leader, 99.999 times out of 100, when she would mention a song he would play it and he looked at her and said I, I, i'm sorry i don't know Duncan Shane. i don't know that song she was dumbfounded that it was a song that had escaped his notice and casey sinange and i went back to the office and by the two o'clock show so really a three-hour period we had a song to the tune of Duncan Shane with rosie berating john for not knowing Duncan Shane. And it was like, you know, Duncan Shane, don't know Duncan Shane. Um, and he'd say, you know, no lay Miz, Phantom and the Wiz, only trouble is. And he would sing about Duncan Shane. It was a, it was a duet about not knowing Duncan Shane. Well, at, prior to the morning show, there was nothing there. And then all of a sudden we had a running bit and a song that they sang, you know, together that people were talking about. And this was really before the, the you know, certainly before social media. So the way Ellen has clips go viral and, and Jimmy Fallon has clips go viral. Unless somebody recorded it, you didn't get it, you know? Right. I mean, I remember the first song I ever wrote for the Rosie show was Casey and I wrote a song to the tune of Oklahoma. Rosie sang it with, with Alec Baldwin because they're both from Massapequa. <laughs> and it was the first song I had written after joining the staff in season two. And it was, you know, Massapequa exit 40 on the Southern state, you know, that kind of thing. 
And Newsday ran a whole feature about it the next day. And I said, oh, my gosh, can that really happen where you do something on TV and the next day it's in the news? Um, I love that. I love that aspect of it. I can only imagine what it, doing a show like that would be now with social media. Yeah. I mean, what what's interesting about that show is like it ended right just as the Internet was coming into the consciousness of everybody. Right. Well, we had we had the Internet. We had Google and Rosie would do something called Interactive Monday. That was so before its time that it's frightening to think about it. But she would have a laptop on her desk. And every Monday, the laptop would be open. Casey and I would be backstage and people would send questions. And we would then, you know, run through the questions and send the ones that we thought Rosie could or would want to answer. And they would appear on the screen. And then she would answer them either when a guest was sitting there or during a commercial break or whatever. But it was way before its time in terms of reaching out and connecting with the audience. And, you know, I think and I try and I know that you worked on this, too. The the rosy reboots for own, which was essentially not really a reboot, but it was a reintroduction of talk shows for her. Um, Right. She went back to Chicago in 2011 for the Oprah Network, for the OWN Network, and did kind of the Rosie Show 2.0. Uh, no John McDaniel, no Koosh Balls. Same, you know, same Rosie, but a, a different energy to the show, if you will. And the show debuted in early October. I joined it right after Thanksgiving. And it was just very different. It was a different network. Uh, certainly it was a different audience because the viewing audience was, you know, the potential viewing audience was smaller on own. And also from my perspective, the show is on at seven at night. And I'm just not sure that, I'm just not sure that Rosie fans, I mean, of course you could have taped it and watched it the next day, but it wasn't live. It didn't have the same energy, didn't have the same caliber guests. I mean, Rosie is Rosie. She was extraordinary on it, but it just didn't have the same feel. And I feel like it wasn't for everybody. Like the, 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 the great thing about the, the first iteration of it was that a young kid like me at the time could have watched it and got something out of it. But a middle-aged mother at home could get something out of it too. Yeah, I think that, I mean, listen, nobody asked me, I mean, you're asking me, but nobody's asked me this before, but the first show was fun with a capital F, capital U, capital N. The, the, the Chicago show was kind of like, a, hey, let's try it again. And it didn't, it didn't feel the same. Plus, and maybe it's because it was in Chicago and we couldn't get the guests. We didn't have the audience size, so we couldn't get the caliber giveaways. I mean, Rosie gave away trips. She gave away college scholarships. I mean, it was not it was not the same in Chicago. So how soon after Rosie the first time around are you writing Take Me Out of the Bathtub? Well, that book actually came out. Um, the Rosie show ended in May of 2002. And that book actually came out in May of 2001. And she was very kind. Uh, she gave me a quote for the back of the book. And uh, I believe she did a giveaway on the show and shot a video for me to, to show to booksellers saying, hey, you know, my buddy Alan Katz is got a new book and uh, he writes songs for my show. So take a look at this book. It was a very kind um, push forward for me on that. I had also written a book about cats and she had me on as a guest again, you know, very kind, very caring person. And I, the way I, the way I discovered you before knowing about the whole Rosie connection was that first book. And yeah, take take me out of the bathroom term 20 on, on uh, May 1st of this year. And I, you know, I, I told, you know, 
I told my mother that I was interviewing you and she's like, I remember that book. You read it all the time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it happens. It, it happens more times than I can tell you. And I have two sons in college and one of them will consistently report back to me. My professor grew up on your book or my professor has, is singing your book to the kids. He always calls and says, hey, I need a copy for so-and-so. Um, and happy to do that. Listen, if there's a second generation singing stinky, stinky diaper change to the tune of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, I'm very happy. That's, that's so, it's so great because it was, I don't even, I, I think I, I purchased it at like one of those scholastic book fairs. And right, there have been millions of copies sold at Scholastic Book Fair. And it was just, it, it was one of those things where you just see the cover and you're just so enthralled by the illustrations and then you peek into it and it's just hilarious. Yeah, I do, I do have to say that the illustrations are by David Catro, who is an extraordinary illustrator. Uh, others will recognize his work from Stan Tull, Molly Lumellen, Ink and a Paint No More. And Take Me Out of the Bathtub gave birth to eight other silly dilly songbooks, as we called them. Uh, songs about manners, songs about parents, songs about potty training. There's a Christmas book. And something you may not know, uh, and in fact, your audience probably doesn't know because it's kind of a Connecticut secret, is that I turned those songbooks into a musical. I knew, yeah. Oh, you yeah. knew. Well, then I shouldn't accuse you of not knowing anything. You're yeah. good. Um, we, we did about 30 performances at the Stepping Stones Museum for Children here in Connecticut uh, of the Silly Dilly musical. And I'm thrilled to say that my son, David, who is a musical theater major in college right now, performed in quite a few of the uh, productions when he was available and starred in it, and nothing better than turning a, a book into a musical and turning a son to an, into a musical star. So the Silly Dilly musical, what we basically did, because there are 126 songs in the nine songbooks, like Stinky Stinky Diaper Change, or there's a food fight song to the tune of My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. And what we did was there's a game show host named Wink Blinkman, based on loosely on my friend Wink, Wink uh, Martindale. And he says, I have the four finalists for the Silly Dilly Song competition. And at random, I will pick a category and he's got a randomizer board, kind of like the board on Press Your Luck. Great. And he says, okay, the category is brothers and sisters. And each performer stands up and sings a song about siblings. And after we go through five or six rounds, the audience decides who, which is the silly dilliest song. And that person wins a million dollars and a big trophy and all that. There's also a story in there about being kind and about inclusion because the stage manager, as he's setting up the microphones and, and being part of, of the performances says, Hey, I'd like to sing. And they all say, no, no, you're not in this contest. Please you go backstage. And then finally, he says, I really can. I have a chance. And one of the performances says, yeah, what do you think, audience? And the audience cheers, saying, yes, give him a chance. And he blows the audience away singing Take Me Out of the Bathtub, the title song, if you will. And I'd say 70% of the time after singing that song, he wins the competition. But at the end, there's a message of be kind, include everybody, give everybody a chance because you never know what people can do. So I'm very proud of that musical. The pandemic kind of took us off the stage, but we're talking to other people now about bringing it back either on a local or perhaps even a New York City basis and uh, keep an eye out for that. Yeah, it's, it's so funny that, well, not funny, but it's kind of interesting that you talk about inclusion so much because I've you know one of the things that I've heard you say is like just don't make jokes at the expense of other people. Yeah I do a lot of school visits, quite a few school visits around the country. Certainly when when the pandemic uh, hit that turned into Zoom visits. But 
kids often raise their hands and say, hey, can I tell you a joke? And invariably, it's a joke that in some way demeans somebody. So I put it in my presentation and I, I have slides about it and I talk about it pretty seriously that I say, you know, it's really easy to make a joke. A lot of people make funny jokes, but you know what? A joke isn't funny if even one person is hurt. You know, I, sometimes I see Nickelodeon or Disney Channel and three kids are having lunch and somebody walks in with his or her tray and they say, oh, here comes the smelliest or you know, something like that. And that person walks away sad. Three people are laughing. One person is hurt. That's not a good joke. I don't care if a thousand people can laugh at it. If one of them, if one person takes offense or it, it attacks them in some way, it's not a joke worth telling. And it's not a joke you'll see in my books. And, and I believe that. And when I say that, the teachers and the principal and all the educators nod their heads like bobblehead dolls, because, you know, we're all in it together. We gotta, we gotta be kind to each other. Yeah. I mean, that, if I could bring this to a personal note, that sort of means a lot to me because there are some books that I read where you're you're throwing not much anymore, but there are some books or some TV shows where you're throwing a a, a kid with special needs and special education or in a wheelchair in a dumpster, and that just doesn't fly now and it shouldn't even have fly then so no no it's absolutely true it's absolutely true and you know i mean look don rickles made a career of put down humor but there are too many good jokes out there that we can share that everybody can enjoy like what like and, one of mine that i always say is that i'm a shit up comedian oh that's very funny and i shit for what i believe in like stuff like that <laughs> like this, Self-deprecating. Like, if you can laugh at yourself, then you're doing it right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's well said. Absolutely. So, like, when when you have the, the school visits, what are some of the stories you hear? Because I'm sure you've met people in wheelchairs and people with challenges. How do they receive your book i mean i'm sure it's not much different as and any other reader but are there any stories that stick out well not not so much that i can think of right now frankly um you know kids kids are kids are kids um and you know, we all have different experiences. Look, I talk about when, when I was a kid, I was, I was bullied quite a bit and, you know, used humor as a defense mechanism, certainly in, in a self-deprecating way very often. But one of the ways that I got out of being bullied, and it's crazy to me to think about it now, is I, I mentioned my dad had a children's shoe store and he would sell Puma Clyde sneakers at wholesale price to the bullies to get them to leave me alone. And it's only now that I realized that by doing that, it was pleasing them, but it was also giving them the footwear with which to run after me faster and better. So, you know, everybody's got, everybody's got some kind of, uh, what's the word? Not a secret, but but you know, we all we all face differences. Everybody got something, one thing that makes them unique. One yeah, no, absolutely absolutely. Listen, I, I can't tell you how many schools I visit where uh, one something that schools like to do is uh, they pick kids to have lunch with me. And it I guess it's a big honor for them. And they have a contest, sometimes it's a writing contest. Sometimes it's a, you know, neatness contest, whatever it is. In fact, one, one teacher showed me a letter that the boy wrote. I would really like to have lunch with Alan Katz because I'd like to meet an author, but especially because I really, really like lunch. And, and sitting with the kids and, you know, invariably they'll say to me, I don't like to read. I don't like to write. 
I say, well, why not? It's like, I don't see anything good about reading or writing. And if, if an interaction, whether it's a personal interaction or sitting in an audience that I'm talking, and I talk about my love of writing and my love of creativity. Um, you know, I was at a school in Brooklyn a few years ago, and I said to a second grade class, um, hey, kids, let's write a poem. Um, now, not all poems rhyme and not all poems are funny, but let's write a rhyming poem. And the teacher yelled from the back of the room. I, I, chills go through me when I think about it. She yelled, they can't rhyme. And I, and I looked at her and I said, well, let me try. And I said, hey, kids, here's the sound at, like cat. What other words sound like cat? And somebody said bat and somebody said mat and somebody said hat. Now, somebody said dog, which is right in a contextual perspective, but not in a rhyming. And I made a list of the rhyming words on the board. And we wrote a poem. And afterwards, she said, I can't believe they could rhyme. I never would have thought they could rhyme. And I said, you know, I wasn't asking them to change a carburetor. This, this is a sounding thing. This is a second grade exercise, a certain grade skill. And it made me very sad because what else does she think they can't do? Yeah. You know, so, so we got to rhyme, you know, and, and I got a poem today. A, a little girl wrote me a poem today saying, I really love your poetry. Your poetry. I really love your book, Oops. She sent me a poem. Um, if I can inspire anybody out there to write their own poem or think of themselves as a poet, as other authors inspired me, boy, am I lucky. And it's interesting because for years, I would say about 10 years, I've been toying around with an idea for a novel that I just that I just haven't you know cracked the code because it, it's more it's kind of like breaking the fourth wall like talking to the audience but it's about disability it's about disability and it's about those themes but I also don't want it to be labeled as the book for people with disability you know what I'm saying so mm-hmm so it's a line that you have to cross, but trying to make it accessible at the same time. Well, I think I think you probably have have a unique voice, not knowing what the story is and not knowing exactly what the manuscript would be. You know, if you have a chance to share a new perspective with with readers, I think you should definitely go for it. Never mind how people label the book. If you're going to help anybody and and you know, change change some some viewpoints or or inform some people. Way to go! Because like because I've noticed you probably noticed this too. As far as inclusion for people with disabilities, we're still not where we need to be. I understand that. And when I see something on TV where it's like make room for this kid or something like that. It's like, why can't they just exist? Why can't they be one? No, I why get can't that. they I'm... be one in the group? You know, it's like frustrating. But it's also my friend Marilyn Singer, who is an incredibly gifted children's poet, um, has a new book out. I'm just looking it up and it just got a tremendous review about a child in a wheelchair a child with a dog, and um, she she's written about a, a naughty puppy, and and you know the boy is in a wheelchair, but he's a boy experiencing life with a dog, and um, I commend her for that. It's it's a you know it, be, people, as I said, people are people. Yeah, and even if something as simple as you know doing this podcast where it's me expressing my my thoughts and how pop culture has impacted me throughout my my mm-hmm. struggles and challenges. It's a pretty cool thing because it could have been like a poor me situation, but I kind of flipped it and made it kind of sarcastic and irreverent and fun. That's wonderful. That, well, I'm I'm honored and very happy to be part of it today. So the one thing I wanted to ask you was, how do we're going back a long way? But how do you how do you end up writing for Goof Troop? 
For Groove Trip, well, I was living in L.A. My my wife and I uh, moved out to L.A. She had a an assignment as a journalist, and I joined her and was looking for sitcom writing work and had been sending around some spec scripts for the Gary Shandling show and Three's Company and and then a show called Grand, which was a short-lived NBC series. And I got a call one day from someone at Disney saying, you know, hey, we really like your scripts, but this is the kids animation department. But we like your your way with dialogue. Could you possibly um, come on in and, and do some scripts with us? And I said, you bet. So I ended up with an office uh, on the lot in Burbank at Disney and wrote a couple of episodes of Goof Troop. And then that led to, as I said, one thing leads to another. That led to somebody recommending me to Warner Brothers. And I did I don't know, five or six episodes of uh, Tasmania. Um, also at Disney, I did a series called Raw Tunage, Disney's Raw Tunage. That was a CBS series. It was a brilliant idea that I don't think worked very well. It was on up. Now, that one I never I never had heard of until I... Uh... It, it was on opposite Saved by the Bell, as I remember. And I was nominated for a daytime Emmy for that, actually, and lost to Batman because he can't beat Batman. But it was the concept was Saturday Night Live in animation for kids using Disney characters. So what they did was the host, if you will, on a particular episode would be Scrooge McDuck or Sebastian the Crab or another classic Disney character. And then there were sketches. And they also introduced a few other cartoons within that. One of them was more Supalami. But I did a segment. I did, I guess, about eight or nine of them. Um, called Totally Tasteless Video. And being Disney, it wasn't totally tasteless, but they were parodies. I did um, Doggy Schnauzer, MD. It was a puppy doctor in the hospital. I did um, So You Think You're So Smart or something like that. It was a game show parody. I did Robin Hoof, which was a cow that robs from the rich and gives milk to the poor. Uh, I did Nightmare on Rocky Road, which was a Freddy Krueger parody that uh, he turned everything into ice cream. And they were silly, gentle parodies. Um, did one called the All Potato Network. It was like a a um, like a network coming attractions of things that were on, but everything was potato themed, like Spud, Spudsky and Hutch, things like that. Um, very silly, very, very silly. But those were those were a joy to do. Now, like, how long did that last? Because, well, I was probably at Disney for about half a year, and Warner Brothers about the same. Warner Brothers, I didn't have an office; that was more of a freelance thing. But I'd finish an episode, and they'd give me another one uh, to to do. They were eleven minute episodes, two of them in a half hour, and I still see them once in a while. And in fact, on Disney Plus, you can see at least one of my Goof Troop. Yeah, I'm trying to not even say that, like, the way you write is so kind of zany and off the wall in the best sense of the word. Um, Thank you. Like, are there any problems with standards and practices or the higher up being like, oh, you can't say this? Was there anything you had to cut? Well, it was funny. I worked on a show. Uh, it was an ABC show done by PBS, done by the Children's Television Workshop. It was a show called Crow. It didn't run very long. But Crow was a cave boy who lived in a valley. And I remember one episode where I'd written a script where Crow was stuck in a ravine and it looked like there was no way out. He was trapped. And his friends, the birds, came and picked him up by the loincloth and carried him to safety. And the not standard and practices so much, but the the um, scientists working on the show said, no, nope, you got to change that. Birds cannot work in concert to lift that heavy an object. So you need to change it. And I said, so wait a minute, let me get this straight. Birds can't work together to lift a boy and save him. But when he's out of the ravine, his best friend is a mammoth who talks. And they said, oh, yes, the mammoth talks, but birds can't lift the guy. So, I mean, you make changes like that based on their nonsensical 
making sense. Um, the mammoth was fine to talk, but the birds couldn't help. So, you know, what are you going to do? Um, yeah, no, there were, there were things with, you know, Disney was fine. I think they were, they were fine. In fact, there's a spot because Doggy Schnauzer is a puppy doctor in a human hospital, kind of like Doogie Hauser was a teenage doctor. And I remember there was conversation because, oh, I know there was one moment. You, you make a good point. I don't know if you've heard this story before, but they bring a man into the emergency room and he's got a protrusion in his stomach. He's on a gurney and his, his stomach is protruding and he, Doogie jumps in or, you know, goes in like a dog does and says, um, what's the problem? And they say, this man just swallowed a set of dishes. And they made me change it because apparently on the show, Darkwing Duck, the character of Darkwing Duck had to climb down out of a building and he threw his scarf around his neck and then threw this, this, the end of the scarf out the window and climbed down. And then a kid did that and broke his leg. Oh. So they said, we can't have any copycat behavior. And I said, well, nobody's going to swallow a set of dishes. And they said, no, but a kid could take a plate and chew on it, trying to eat dishes. So we ended up making it, this man just swallowed a dishwasher. And indeed, the protrusion was shaped like a giant box, like a dishwasher would be, <laughs> because they were satisfied with that, because no kid's going to swallow a dishwasher. I'm so glad that I jogged that memory for you. Please. Thank you. That's very funny that you mentioned that. Oh, my gosh. And then, of course, Doogie yells, oh, my gosh, that's the spin cycle. There's no time to waste. <laughs> so you're right about that. Thank you. You are good. Because, you know, I've, you know, I've spoken with writers and people and I've heard some pretty ridiculous story. <laughs> so it. Listen, I hope I can tell this story, but I worked on Kids or People, too. My first job was on Kids or People, too, the first season. And it was the, it, during the days of CB radios. So we played a game where Bob McAllister, the host, who, who had also hosted Wonderama, for your listeners who remember Wonderama, what a great guy and what a great show. Um, and we played a CB radio game where Bob would get kids on the stage and then the CB radio would come to life and somebody would say, to be or not to be, or whatever they would say, and the kids had to guess who it was. And it was Shakespeare or it was whoever. And I remember we wanted one with Tom Sawyer. And I picked a section from Huck Finn or Tom Sawyer uh, to read for the, for the voice to read. And the head of children's television came up and said, I don't like that. That's a boring segment. Let me pick one. And she picked one and said, you have to use this one. And it was seemingly at random that she changed it. Because I said, I don't really think that's something we want to read out loud. And she said, just do what I, I said. So the actor playing Huck Finn, playing um, Mark Twain read the thing, and it was about Tom Sawyer and his friend Becky and his friend Charlie Bates. And the segment said, Tom Finn... Uh, Tom, Tom Sawyer, Becky, comma, Master Bates down the river. And it, it was clearly oh saying Master God. Bates. And, and I said, you can't put that on the air. And she said, just go with it. And on the show, it actually, the sentence was constructed in such a way that it was a list. And it was, you know, down by the river, Becky, Tom Sawyer, Master Bates, whatever it was. Um, and that's the way it went on, on ABC. Now, if if you have if you need to make a you need to make a novel or a book about that. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. So, it, you know, even then I knew what should and shouldn't be on television. Listen, I booked Gallagher, the comedian, the water and smashing comedian, on Kids Are People too. <coughs> Excuse me. It was his first network appearance. And he came out and did about seven minutes of hilarious comedy all about dead babies. And at the end of the, the segment, they said, yeah, please leave. We can't use a word of that and never put him on the show. Oh. 
Yeah. I mean, his career didn't suffer from that, but it's true. Television is a crazy world. We also had a situation where it was a very, very long first taping. I mean, literally an hour and a half show took 12 hours. And the last guest was Julia Serving, Dr. J, the basketball star. And it was at the theater where Dick Cavett did his um, famous talk show. Oh, yeah. And the down the downstairs was where all the kids were, and the balcony was where the parents were. And it somehow got into the parents' section that if they, they stayed, because parents were coming down and saying, Come on, Jimmy, we got to go home. You have school tomorrow. Because it was literally a 12-hour taping with no food for the kids. And the parents somehow somebody heard erroneously that if they stayed, Julius Irving would sign a basketball for every kid. Absolutely not true. Uh Oh, and at the end of the segment, Bob said, hey, everybody, thank you for staying. Thank you for being here. You're part of a of an extraordinary first show. We're sorry it took so long, but go home and watch yourselves on TV. You're the best. Goodbye. And the parents started yelling, where are our basketballs? Nobody knew anything about these basketballs. Parents were throwing knitting needles and magazines and anything onto the stage, booing and hissing. So that was my very first television show. And I'm you could like seriously, you could write a whole tell all book about your time. In. Well, it's fun to it's fun to relive the stories. That was 1978. It's fun to relive the stories, but you know, they're not necessarily my stories to tell. So on the note of like telling stories, are there any book ideas that you've had that you've been wanting to do that, but just haven't been able to do yet just because of logistical reasons or just. Well, I mean, the market changes. I I had an idea for a book series. You know, my twin boys are 21. I mentioned David before, but they're 21. And when, when I used to read to them when they were kids, one of them loved biographies and one of them loved funny books. And there was no, reading the same book to both of them. There just was no book that they would both enjoy. And I once said, gee, there's no funny biographies. I can't read a book, the same book to both of you. And a light went on and I said, wait a minute, what if I wrote some funny biographies? And literally 2010, over, over a decade ago, I wrote some books called Liographies, the absolutely untrue, totally made up 100% fake life story of the world's greatest heroes. So I did Babe Ruth, Amelia Earhart, Thomas Edison, and Houdini. Brought them to publishers, and they all said the same thing. Funniest books we've ever read. We can't stop laughing, but we can't publish them because we can't put misinformation out there. And I said, it's not misinformation if I tell you I'm lying to you. I'm just entertaining Yeah, it's right there. I don't expect you to believe that, you know, there's a section in, in the Babe Ruth book where it says Babe was such an interesting man that he often visited kids in the hospital. And while there, being such a curious man, he was often do unnecessary surgery on them, removing a kidney or a spleen for no good reason. Then he would pay a real doctor to put it back. And a reporter once said, Babe, isn't it hard removing a kidney or a spleen without any medical training? And Babe said, no, hitting a fastball is hard. Removing a kidney is a piece of cake. And for good measure, he removed the reporter's kidney and had a piece of cake. Well, hopefully a kid will laugh their heads off at that without thinking, oh, Babe Ruth did surgery. Well, I couldn't sell the books. And a, a friend turned them into um, ebooks. And we launched them on Amazon as ebooks. And when a kid bought one of them, he or she bought all of them. They were widely regarded as being hilarious, but they didn't sell that enthusiastically. So we took them down. I continued to pitch it over the years. And literally last October, a publisher uh, named Tanglewood published them, illustrated them. They're now available as paperbacks. And, you know, the pandemic hurt their their marketing a little bit um, because I didn't get out to schools and I didn't get out to book festivals as I might have, but the books are out there. And for my money, they're as funny as anything I've ever written. They are great. I've checked them out. They're really fun. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. 
just by like like I you know I love that type of humor where it's like kind of you're in on the joke but you're not in on the joke it's so well, you know, it's funny. I, I give kids a lot more credits than than many authors do. Um, m- my buddy, Dan Gutman, who is, for my money, the funniest person out there, um, ha- has written, I don't know, 70 My Weird School books. And they're just hilarious. And when a kid picks it up, they know they're not about to get necessarily smarter. They're not going to get enriched in a in a way that a nonfiction book would enrich them, but they're going to have a good time. They're going to become better readers, you know, and, and I love that. And, you know, when I write books that are silly, if I write a poem, here's an example in my poetry book. Oops. I wrote 100 poems illustrated by the amazing Ed Corin. It's kind of a Shel Silverstein poetry book. And there's a poem in there called the lollipop. It's the shortest, simplest poem you're ever going to read. excuse me and it's probably the most popular poem in the book it's got two words one of them repeats a lot listen to my poem it's called the lollipop lick 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 stick after all his licks what do you have left just the stick well i've probably gotten 500 poems from kids over the years where they say hey i just thought of a poem it's called the ice cream cone and it comes in various forms, but it's basically lick, 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 plop. The scoop falls off. How much do I love that hearing my poem inspired them to be a poet? You know, I mean, I, I try to tell kids, you may not love writing, but I can promise you no matter what job you do when you grow up, it's going to involve writing. And the better you do it today, the better you're going to do it tomorrow and next week and next year. And I see I see a light go on. And, you know, not every when I visit, not every kid says, OK, I'm going to write. But enough of them do that. I feel very good about sharing. You know, I'm not the Pied Piper of, of literature, but um, I feel very good about sharing the the joys of reading and writing. Even if you could ignite one kid or a group of kids, then I would say you've done your job right. Well. I, I treasure the letters that I get from teachers saying, or from parents, you know, I've gotten letters that I, I, it's unbelievable. Somebody wrote to me, I, I, I wish I had it handy and said, I just have to tell you, my son has avoided books as if he's allergic to them. He's avoided writing as if he didn't know the alphabet and he hasn't stopped reading and writing since you were at the school. Do I take, I didn't invent reading, I didn't invent writing, but if I made it seem like fun and I made it seem like something everybody can and should do. And she said, you know, it was just this letter that was insane. It was like, bless you for unlocking whatever it is in our student that we couldn't do and doctors couldn't do and the teachers couldn't do. And, you know, I mean, just wow. That's, you know, that's the, that's the kind of letter I show to my family right away because basically I'm writing fart jokes and making kids laugh, hopefully. But if I have that kind of kind of um, connection with with some of them, that's just terrific. So what are some of your current projects? What are you working on? Well, I have a new book that came out last week. And it's an adult picture book. I've done five or six adult humor books. And you may know this, but before the pandemic, 22 percent of millennials were living with their with their parents again. So parents who thought they'd be empty nesters suddenly are America's innkeepers again, housing their kids and sharing their meatloaf and all that. That happened to us. We downsized within Connecticut. We have two adult kids who are in the workforce, one in New York City and one in D.C. And I mentioned my two sons are in college. Well, once they left, we downsized. But for the pandemic, they all came home. And suddenly our five-seater couch had six people on it. And I wrote a book for all the empty nesters who lost their empty nest and are are entertaining their kids at home again. And it came out last week. It's illustrated by Craig Orbach. It's called Get the Hell Out of My House. It's a picture book to help those adults know that they're not alone. Um, 
And it's like, I really love you as a child, but I want to be alone with my spouse. So pack up your shit, go call a truck and get the hell out of my house. Um, And each spread has a different aspect of the story. Of course, at the end of the book, the parent says, basically, I don't care where you go, just get out. But do me a favor. As soon as you get wherever you're going, give me a call and let me know you got there safely. So there's some caring in there, too. Um, It's all good natured. But uh, that book came out last week. Uh, I have two books coming out next month. One is an early reader. Talk about a departure from Get the Hell Out of My House. It's an early reader about the elves and their school that they go to, uh, uh, the Elf Academy. It's called Elf Academy. Trouble in Toyland is the first book. There's going to be one every few months. Um, And it's the story of an elf who enjoys making toys, but wants more and wants to be creative and use his own his own voice and not build the same bicycles and dolls over and over and over. Um, So that'll be at September 19th. And in October, actually, it just got moved. I said it was next month, but it's October 12th. Um, I was fortunate enough to do uh, the first couple of books uh, working in a new series uh, called Misty the Cloud. And Misty is a cloud who has kind of human emotions. She's got a bunch of friends and human emotions and, learns to deal with things that young readers have to deal with about, you know, disappointment or, or tantrums or things like that. And it's written with Dylan Dreyer, who is the uh, third hour host of the Today Show. She's also a, a meteorologist and an extraordinarily wonderful person and creative. This was her vision. She and her husband had come up with the character of Misty many years ago. And I helped her uh, bring the first couple of books to life. And hopefully it'll be an ongoing series. Um, So I'm very excited about that. I got time for one more. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, The fourth book in a series, the first two came out this past January. Um, The third one came out last month. And in November is book four. Did I say the fourth one? The third one came out in July. Fourth one comes out in January. It's a series called The Society of Substitutes. It's the story of Milton Worthy, who is a second grader, kind of a beaver cleaver, kind of um, popular, curious kid. And his mother is not only an occasional substitute teacher in his class, but she also happens to be a superhero in the Society of Substitutes. And she and Milton and Milton's uh, best friend, a girl named Morgan, help save the world from a world domination threat by the classroom ferret, Noah. (laughs) Noah escapes and in every book has a devious plot to take over the world and Milton and Mrs. Worthy and Morgan um, put an end to the plot and save the world until at least the next book. Um, There are six in that series. The first three have been very nicely received. I'm looking forward to the fourth one coming out. And then there are two more, uh, one next March on March 1st, which is my birthday, and then probably several months after that. They're heavily illustrated by Alex Lopez, so there's illustrations on almost every page, and I think they're, they're delightful, available in paperback and hardcover, and schools are enjoying them in their libraries, and kids are enjoying them in a, uh, you know, collect all six kind of way. So basically, you're not doing much. <laughs> I'm not doing much. No, I'm listen, I'm I'm very fortunate to be able to to sit at my desk and uh, and do creative things. Although talking about sitting at my desk, I do have to tell you, I deeply, deeply, deeply love and respect and and think the world of my kids. But I do have to tell you, I have a uh, a pretty bad hand nerve issue. And as a result, I'm, my left hand is painful 24 seven. And it makes typing sort of a challenge. So that's the one limitation on my writing career. So very often I dictate. Well, you know what? You know, if I can type with one finger, you can. Oh, no, I get it. I get it done. But, no, like, but we, I, you we know, can get through this together. But, is it, but at the end, well, I have to tell you this story. At the end of the day, my hand feels like you've jumped on it. Oh, you've yeah. stepped on it and jumped mm-hmm. on it. And, and as a result, sometimes I dictate my work. And during the pandemic, I was sitting at my desk dictating. Now, I'm not too far. My desk is not too far 
from our kitchen. And it's important you know that because I was sitting at my desk. I pressed the function key twice on my Mac and I start to dictate. And my son, Nathan, opens the cupboard within shouting distance and yells, hey, who ate the last freaking Pop-Tart? Although he didn't say freaking. (laughs) Who ate the last freaking Pop-Tart? And the words typed right under my screen. (laughs) So in the middle of my document, in the middle of my document, I say, who ate the last freaking Pop-Tart? Now, that would have been a disaster. And that's when I decided to write Get the Hell Out of My House because I I love them. I couldn't think more of them as people, but boy, we're surrounded. (laughs) That is great. It wasn't great when it happened. But it is now. Um, I very often write funny speeches for network executives, top TV network executives, roast material, things like that. And this was a document. It was a pretty serious document for the head of a major television network. And in the middle of it, I see, wait, the last freaking Pop-Tart. So, you know, it could have been a disaster. That would be a whole different speech. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And invariably, I'll, I'll say into the keyboard, you know, I'll say, I'll be there at four o'clock. And my wife will yell from the next room, where are you going? It's like, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to Siri. So... And sometimes Siri doesn't pick up. It, it you'll say a word and it'll say something completely different. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, did you hear that the inventor of autocorrect died? No. It's it, yeah. His funeral is tomato. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, I didn't write that joke, but it's a very good joke. Most of my Facebook feed is bad puns, so I think we'll get along quite well. I, lo- I love, I love bad puns. I, I absolutely love bad puns. One of the things I do is I, I send jokes and puns to my daughter. My daughter's a speech pathologist in New York City. And every morning I send her, you know, things I see on the inter- internet that are just ridiculous. And I'll send, it, I'll send it to people and I'll be like, they'll be like, really? Again? <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I get that, too. But you know what? It's my career, so it's okay. So where can people find the 10,000 things you're doing? Well, I always say go to your local bookstore because, boy, do we need to support independent bookstores. Yeah. Our our local one is closing up shop pretty soon. I'm pretty up. Are they? I hear that all too often. But anytime, anytime you can... Take your business to a local bookstore. Um, those are the people who stock the books. They recommend the books. They care about books. Um, certainly all my books are on Amazon. And, you know, if you order now, you'll have the book in 20 minutes. But yeah, it's, a, it's keeping the bookstores open. You know, it, it's the local businesses are so important. And, and these people are book experts. And Whenever possible. I mean, if you walk in and say, you know, I want a copy of Get the Light of My House, if if they don't have it, they'll order it and you'll have it within a few days or they'll just say, get the hell out of my store. I'm not sure which. Um, but any of the books that I've mentioned are either readily available or ready, readily orderable, if that's a word. And, uh, you know, if you look at Alan Katz, A-L-A-N, Katz, K-A-T-Z, books.com, you can see more about me and more about the books and uh, they're out there. So um, thank you so much for talking with us today. It has been so fun and I hope to have you back on soon. This has been great. What, what a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you do. And, and thank you for, for bringing, you know, creative folks to, to, other folks who just enjoy creativity. Well, everybody's creative. What am I saying? It's not like you're bringing boxers to people who can't box. Everybody's creative. Everybody's got creative. But it's more of an analytical, yeah. I mean, I have stories to tell. And, and you know, people who watched the Rosie O'Donnell show didn't live those stories. But we're all in this together. We all, we all share that. Absolutely. The DJ Bob Show. Pop culture, past and present.